Anybody ready for the word of God this morning? Anybody feel like being preached to? All right. Amen. Didn't the worship team do a great job? I just want to say thank you to all of our volunteers, uh, sound, audio. Can we give it up for them as well? Sound and audio, thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, apparently, I'm cuter today than I was yesterday because face ID is not showing up. So me, there we go. Anybody get nervous when your phone doesn't recognize your face? Anyway, um, I'm ready for the word of God this morning. And I don't know if it, about you, but I'm excited about what he's going to do and um, what he's going to do in the room. Amen. Amen. I, just, I just pray that whatever happens today marks you in a serious way. We don't want to do church as normal. We don't want average we want an encounter with a real God who could do real things in real time. Amen. And so I'm just believing that. Would you stand to your feet uh, for the honoring of God's word? This is the last time that you'll stand um, unless it's just so good you can't help yourself. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Now, if you're reading your Bible today, it might be a little bit different because I'm reading out of the message translation, which I don't really believe is a translation as much as it is a commentary. But I just like how well he puts it in the message version of the Bible. Someone say amen. amen. <laughs> but don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you were outsiders to God's ways, had no idea of any of this, didn't know the first thing about the ways God works, hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of the rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. <laughs> Such a weird break. Um, <laughs> now, because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it all together are in on everything. Let's just read that again. Now, because of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood, you who were once out of it all together are in on everything. That's good news. That's, that's, the, that's the type of news. They don't even need any help. The word doesn't even need my help. The word is so good. You who were once out of it all together are now in, not on some of it, not on part of it. You are now in on everything. Heirs to the throne. You went from darkness to light. You went from anxious to peace. You went not because of any other reason, but because God shed his blood. That's good news. One more verse, because I, before I lose my mind, Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul writes to the church of Corinth and says, For I have decided that while I was with you, I would forget, some say, everything. I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Now, I, if I had a title of my message for you today, and you can tell your favorite neighbor the title of my message, whichever one you like the most, uh, I'm so done. I'm so, I'm so done. High five somebody, find your seat. I'm so done. I'm so done. Not, not great words to hear. Hey. Church, listen, can I, can I tell you this? Can I give you, I'm just going to open up my heart for just a second and tell you some things that we need to stop doing. Can I tell you some things, church, believers, you, some of you older married couples, you know one of the things we need to stop doing? We have to stop putting pressure on young couples to have babies. It's like, where are you going, Pastor? Listen, you need to understand. We have to stop doing this. Do you understand what a child does to your life? Like, man, it's the greatest gift. It's the greatest blessing. But no one prepares you to have a kid. I haven't set my alarm since Carter Grace was born. I haven't had to. She's my own personal private alarm clock. And she's more violent because she will slap me in the face waking me up and tell me that it is a good morning and I'm going to like it whether I like it or not. 
We have to stop telling people, man, when are y'all going to have kids? When are y'all going to have kids? When are y'all going to have kids? Listen, let them live their life for a minute. For just a second. They, they can get to having kids, but you need to know you're never ready to have a kid. It is the greatest blessing and the greatest curse. <laughs> it is the greatest blessing and the largest burden. No one will test you like a two-year-old will. No one will show you how selfish you are like a three-year-old will. Nobody will command your schedule like a two-year-old two will. I'm telling you, stop, we have to stop this. But let me just tell you this. I love my daughters. My daughters are incredible. They're hilarious. Every single day is a new thing. Every single day when I wake up, whether I like it or not, I'm going to learn something new from my kids. And, and Carter's in this, if you don't know, Carter Grace is our three-year-old. We have a seven-year-old. And not too long ago, she was learning how to talk. And she loved to just talk, and she just make up words and create words, and like Pastor Tom does, he just makes up words. Like <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but one of the things that I loved about Carter Grace was, as she was growing up and as she was beginning to to learn how to talk, she l learned how to love to talk. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Like you know those people that talk, and then those people that love to talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Husbands, stay forward, <laughs> brother. Don't look to the left, set your face like flint, son. Don't look, don't sneeze, don't blink wrong. But there's some people that love to talk, and I love this because one thing that I love about my daughter is she cannot keep a secret. Listen, if you want, if you want something to stay a secret, do not let Carter Grace find out about it because she will snitch on you. And I love this because I ask her, we get in the car, I'm like, hey, baby, how was your day? It was good. Were your teachers nice to you? Yeah, they were. If they weren't, would you tell me? Because daddy will beat somebody. He's not. I'm saved, not soft. I'm, I'm just telling you. And I'm glad that she snitches, right? But ministry with kids, I, we, we went to the, I went to a hospital to be with a family uh, as they were transitioning. One of their family members were transitioning from here to heaven. And I was with them. And, and my wife took the girls and went, we, they went to the zoo. And... I get this text message about halfway through the, the hospital visit, and it says that, I said, hey, how, how's it going? Text my wife, hey, how's it going? She says, literally all hell has broken loose. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. She says, Carter is crying. Paige has pooped her pants. I mean, I said, wait, what? Come out. We're not going to skip past that. Like you didn't just say what you just said. You said Paige pooped her pants. Said, yeah, Paige pooped her pants. And then I get this text message. But you better not say a single thing because Paige will kill me if she found out that I told you. Because I'm, I'm like, I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to ride you into the dirt. You. I'm in trouble already. But so, you know, like four hours go by. Four hours go by. I'm still with the family. I'm, I'm literally having to control myself. I'm controlling myself, not getting in, like getting in the car. I'm like, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I get in the car. Carter from the back seat. Dada, sissy pooped her pants. <laughs> And I just lost it. I mean, just when I say I lost it, I lost it because my daughter is a snitch. <laughs> you could tell the anticipation of me not wanting to say anything was magnified in her little two-year-old body that could not wait to tell me the information that she had. And she said, hey. <laughs> Pastor, when we get into the Word, we are. But what happens is... God needs believers in this day and age that cannot keep a secret. God needs believers. He needs a group. He needs a church 
He needs somebody. He needs a man. He needs a woman that cannot keep spiritual secrets from the world and that we would stand up and say that there is only one way, there's only one option, there's only one answer, there's only one solution, and his name is Jesus. The truth of the matter is Jesus plus nothing is enough, and we have to get so enamored with this idea that we can't keep it to ourselves. We need believers that cannot keep spiritual secrets from the world. And we need believers that are stop complaining that the, dark, that the world is getting dark and start being the light. We need believers that would not just have the secret and use the secret and, 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 and keep the secret to themselves. But we would have such believers that there's an anxiety on the inside of us that the love of Jesus would compel us to tell the world how much he loves them. We have this idea and we need more believers, we need more churches, we need more organizations, we need more leaders that would tell the world the truth, and that is Jesus plus nothing is enough. It's not Jesus plus your morals. It's not Jesus. Pastor, can we, get, can we get on to something deeper? Can we talk about eschatology? No, sir. We have to talk about this idea that God loves and is madly in love with you, but not just you. God is madly in love with the world. And it's Jesus, not Jesus plus morals, not Jesus plus do's and don'ts, not Jesus plus who you voted for, not Jesus plus the skin, the color of your skin. It is not Jesus plus anything. You can't add it. You can't subtract it. You put him up against anything, and he is the only thing that he needs, and he's the only thing that we need, and it's the only solution. It's the only answer. You won't find it on Fox. You won't find it on CNN. You won't find it in breaking news, but it is the only news that we need. And we need believers that would be more like Carter Grace that cannot wait to tell somebody that you put Jesus up against any devil, any demon, every disease, any disease, any disorder, any dysfunction. You put him up against any mistake that you've ever made, any label that you've been labeled. If you put him up against your greatest shortcoming, your every insecurity and every spirit, I don't even need to raise my voice. I don't even need to break a sweat with just a whisper, with just a mention of his name. Demons tremble, darkness flees, generational curses are broken at the mention. You put him up against the darkest of the dark in the, in the farthest of the farthest, he's going to redeem, he's going to restore, he's going to deliver, he's going to set free, he's going to pick you up, clean you up, turn you around, set your feet on solid ground, break the generational stuff off of your, break it off of your life, and for no other reason than that is who he is. That there is... There is an understanding that at the mention of his name, the lost are found, the blind see, the lame walk, the confused find clarity, the weak find strength, the depressed find joy, the anxious find peace for no other reason than the cross was enough, is enough, and the cross will always be enough. You put the blood of Jesus up against anything. And it will not break a sweat. You put the cross up against any mistake, and it will not break a sweat. You put the cross up against your mistakes, your shortcomings, your weaknesses, your dysfunctions, the things that were waiting on you before you were even born. You put them up against you, and they lose. Yes. Hear me. Hear me. It is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing. Paul says in our text, for I've decided to know nothing among you but Jesus and him crucified. Why? Because it's not your Sunday morning attendance. It's not your divorce rate. It's not the sicknesses. It's not diseases. It's not what you were born into. It is not an addiction. It's not Jesus plus your efforts, Jesus plus your morals, or Jesus plus your track record. It is Jesus plus nothing equals enough. Yeah, yeah. Hear me. We have the greatest news that has ever hit planet earth 
hope is alive, God is good, that there is light for darkness, Jesus still is madly in love with people, he's the same yesterday, today and forever, he hasn't changed, his mind is made up, his love is for, his love is for us, his mercy is new every morning, his grace is still sufficient and his love has yet to fail. That we have to understand we have the greatest news that has ever hit planet earth. And that is the wrath of God has, has been satisfied. That sin has been paid for. That we have been forgiven, set free, redeemed, restored, delivered. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are in fact the apple of his eye and the object of his obsession. You are, in fact, the reward set before him. You are the reward of his suffering. He shed his blood and died that death for no other reason than you couldn't do it yourself and you couldn't do it on your best day and you couldn't do it on your worst day. We all have fallen short of the glory of God and there was only one solution and it was perfect, righteous, and holy blood spilled. And he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. And if God has given us his son, what more will he withhold from us? You have to understand before you get into this place where you start to buy into your effort and you start to buy into your discipline and you start to buy into your morality, understand without the grace of God, you don't have breath in your lungs. Without the, without the grace of God, you don't have gifts. Without the grace of God, you don't have vision. Without the grace of God, you don't even have the ability to put together a sentence. Without the grace of God, Paul, Paul said, it is, it, I'm the lowly and the least of these to be called an apostle, but because of the grace of God and the grace of God alone, I am who I am today. Where is the church that would be willing to shed, shed light on that secret, that I'm not here because of how well I prayed and how well I devoted in my Sunday mornings, but I'm here for only one reason, and that is God is good and always has been good and always will be good. Good, and he had mercy and he has mercy and he had grace and he has grace and his mercy and his love and his grace have yet to fail yeah. where's the church that would tell them that where's the church that would tell them that you don't have to dress a certain way you don't have to look a certain type you don't have to be a certain way what I love about this room right now is there's all different types of colors all different types of ethnicities all different types of backgrounds there's tattoos and millionaires listen hear me it's the kingdom of God nobody's safe from the love of God no matter your background your ethnicity where you came from your shortcomings your weaknesses God's love is for you Made a way. There seemed to be no way. It's Jesus and only Jesus. Hear me. He's not a way. He's not a truth. He's not a life. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. There is nobody that gets to the Father except through him. There's no other option. And there is no other answer. Where is the church of the living God that would tell the world the truth? That no amount of morals, ethics, standards, do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, accomplishments, discipline, willpower can save us. That God needs a church to start telling the world the truth. And that is that we did in fact nothing to deserve nothing, to earn nothing, to be, to be worthy of this kind of love. I didn't pray hard enough. I didn't read long enough to get here. It's not my devotion. It's not my morals. It's not my ethics, my standards, not what I did or didn't do, where I go or don't go that saves me. I'm not saved 
because of any other thing that I've done or didn't do, I'm, I'm going to do, plan on doing. It's not because I only listen to Christian music. It's not because I don't watch rated R movies. It's not because of these things. It is the unrelenting and never failing love, mercy, and grace that is freely given and extended to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Hear me. The blood still works. The blood is working and always will be working. I need to talk to your heart for just a second, if I may. If you've been raised in church a long time, it might be a little uncomfortable. But if you haven't been raised in church for a minute, let me speak to your heart. Jesus is, was, and always will be enough for you. You put Jesus up against any sinner. He's seated. He's seated. Jesus looks at every sinner and says, I'm so done. Jesus looks at every area of your life. I'm so done. Not the way that you would say, I'm so done. But the way that he says he's so done was when he shed his blood, he was ascended to the right hand of the Father, seated, which is the indicator. He's done. It means that he's not shedding his blood again. He's not coming back again. He's not needing your promise to not be broken. His blood covenant is so strong, so potent, that he only had to die one time for the sins of humanity, for every single person, no matter where you vote, where you come from, your background, your ethnicity, you had a dad, you didn't have a dad, you had two moms, you had two dads, whatever it is, Jesus Christ died for you. While you were yet in your sin, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the church. He didn't die for those that were well put together. He didn't die for that. He died for the sins of humanity and died for you and I. He became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's that simple. It's that simple. And we need a church. There has to be a church. There has to be a group of people that will stop being so enamored with their own efforts and stop being so enamored with their own prayers. Can I say this? We have to, hear me, we have to stop being so enamored with broken people God uses and start being enamored with a God that can use broken people. Here, I'm going to say it again. We have to stop being enamored with broken people that God can use. And start getting enamored with the idea of a God that can use broken people. It's so funny. So we had our, we had our first softball game, men's life bridge softball. We, have, we had our first game. Men's life, men, we had our first game. And as the pastor, there was this dude on the other team who had 42 teeth in his mouth. He had a big mouth. I'm just telling you, he had a big mouth. And at one point, I said, hey, 14, you got a big mouth. And all my teammates were like, hey, pastor, calm down. Towards the end, <laughs> towards the end of the game, I'm walking out of the third field because he's still running his mouth. And I'm walking over to him. I'm finna ask him how many teeth he's got in his mouth because I'm done. <laughs> and then I get, the, I get the second, hey, pastor, calm down. And it was almost like some of the guys were shook that I'm human. <laughs> they were shook that their pastor gets upset. They were shook. <laughs> That their pastor would talk mess on a softball team. But I'm saved. I'm not soft. But listen, we have to stop putting people 
putting people on pedestals. We have to stop putting people thinking that their prayer life and that they float somehow and somehow they're God's favorite. Listen, God is no favor of persons, but he is a favor of principles. And if you want to be one of those guys that has favor, don't be a person that wants to be a favorite. Apply principles and it works. We have to understand where is the message of the gospel that got Jesus crucified? Because it's not in the church. Where is the message of the gospel? Why do all of your friends look like you? How comfortable, hear me, how comfortable are sinners around you? How comfortable? Because listen, you want the litmus test to where you are with I'm not in a religion? Because we say this a lot. I'm not in a religion. I'm in a relationship. <laughs> That's cute, but your life looks like you're in a religion. Because Jesus was so polarizing. Sinners flocked to him. Sinners wanted to eat with him he was so polarizing that he could walk up to a young man and say two words follow me and they would drop their entirety of their life their future their plans their desires their ambitions and just okay no wonder peter was stupid uh, i mean it was just these things what was it about jesus if we as believers i'm way off now are y'all good one service, I got time. Okay. Um, where is it that, our, listen to me, our belief system is when we get saved, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. How close do people feel to Jesus when they're close to you? Because... The track record of the church is often the closer I get to people, the farther away I get from Jesus. Why is that? Because it's true. But because we have become so enamored with ourselves that we have taken the gospel message that is good enough to not be able to hold it as a secret and taking it from now, Jesus plus nothing is enough, to now, Jesus plus, well, kind of your disciplines, well, you should be changed by now. You shouldn't still be dealing with that. Check your heart. And we have taken Jesus plus nothing and turned it into Jesus plus all of your efforts, all your desires, all your ambition. And no wonder no one wants to do that. Because... The end isn't Jesus. The end is bondage. What did, what did Paul say? If you work for something that's a gift, it's no longer a gift but a burden. Can I tell you? Whew, okay. Um, can I tell you? If you feel burned out, you're believing the wrong gospel. If you're tired, you've believed the wrong gospel. All who are tired and weary, come to me that I would give you rest. Why is it that we, we look in the church, we see a bunch of unrested, tired, weary, sensitive Karens? It's like, who is in your prayer closet? Like, how'd you come out more angry? But why? Because we have bought into church culture and not kingdom culture that we work for a finished work instead of working from a finished work. And you're working for something that you already are. No wonder you're tired. Because you believe the wrong gospel. The gospel message of Jesus Christ doesn't say come and work. It says it is finished. Jesus says, I am, I am so done. Listen to me, if, you, if you're resisting this message right now, I just open up your heart for just a second and realize that it is, the, it is the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone 
that saves you. Are you tired? Are you weary? You're trusting in your own willpower more than putting the faith on the finished work of the cross. Why else? Man, I'm so far off. Why else would Jesus not confront people about their sin? I'm fixing to get in a mess. I'm fixing to get in a mess. Jesus, you ne never not once, never not once do you see Jesus confront people about their sin. Don't worry. I'll wait. Try. Think of it. Find it. Search it. But while you're searching for it, read it and see that Jesus, the goodness of God is what leads to repentance. And it is the love and the mercy and the grace and it is unwavering and unchanging. Hear me today, believer, who's been in church for a long time. Are you tired? Are you weary? Do you feel like giving up? Maybe you've believed the wrong gospel, that it's Jesus plus your efforts. Maybe you've learned the wrong gospel, that it's Jesus plus. But it's Jesus plus nothing. It's so good. I'm just waiting on somebody else to get in my car because I can't keep this secret no more. You know why we don't share the gospel? Because we don't believe the gospel. We believe our version, and we wouldn't really, after a couple of years, you don't really want to pull somebody into that mess. You know why you don't share the gospel? You've lost faith. You've lost faith. The greatest, the greatest thing that you're going to face in this world, I'm sorry, this, I didn't even get, I might have to finish. I didn't even get into it, but you have to understand the greatest thing that you're going to face, if you can hear me today, hear me with your heart, the greatest thing that you're going to face is not trials, it's not tribulations, it's not cancer. The greatest trial that you're going to encounter is not a sickness or a disease in your body. The greatest battle that you're going to have in life is not divorce, it's not it's not anger. It's not bitterness. The greatest battle that you're going to ever face is to simply believe that He is who He says He is and that He did what He said He did on behalf of humanity and that God is as good as we say He is. The moment that you actually believe it, Paul said it like this, I believed, therefore I spoke. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know why you don't share the gospel? It's because you haven't encountered the real gospel. You've encountered a man-made version that, would, that they would love to manipulate their behavior. They would love to manipulate your behavior to try and prove to the world that you've changed. And it's exhausting us. The greatest challenge you're gonna, ever going to have is not even death. It's believing in the gospel. mistakes all too well that God has already forgotten. Here, if I, if I walk east, if I just go and walk east, I could walk as long as I want and it'll 
always be east. I just walk, I could change directions and it'll still be east. I could just keep going. When I turn, when I make a turn, and I'm, as long, I'm, I'm still going east. East never meets west. And even in the Old Testament, it says that Jesus is taking your sins as far as the east is from the west. To remember them. No more. Can I tell you? I didn't even get to point one. Can I tell you this? He's so good. And the message is so good. It's almost too hard to believe. It's almost as if it's unreal. It's unimaginable. It's unfathomable. It is, it is uncomprehendable. Jesus paid for the sins of the world. And you don't have to agree for it to work. You don't get to choose who God saved. of the gospel is that it's all inclusive everybody gets in and it's not any for any other reason than the blood of Jesus was just that good the blood of Jesus was just that amazing and listen to me it will keep you from being impressed with yourself when you realize that the sinner who's doing the person that's doing math right now on 80 needs Jesus just as much as the guy with the microphone don't be so enamored with you that you lose sight of him you know why the church is quiet because we've believed the wrong gospel and we've bought into the wrong gospel that the next step you gotta dive in you gotta do this, you gotta get disciplined, you gotta change your circle you're gonna lose friends message of Jesus Christ is that God loves the world and if we cannot be loud with this type of message it's because we don't believe the real message the message is so good it got him killed the message is so good it got him hated the message is so good they, tri- they, they had to sneak him out of cities because they wanted to kill him for putting everyone on the same page they wanted to kill him for putting everybody on the same, everyone needs a savior. Wait, 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 hold on. Wait, what, what, what do you mean? I, just, be, just believe me for just a second. And you have to dive into the reality that he's just that good. The difficulty with the message is that he is just that good. And that Jesus has lost none of its power. The blood of Jesus has lost none of its power. The blood of Jesus is still as potent as the day that it spilled down on Calvary, on that old rugged cross. That what can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing. Nothing. What can make me, what can wash away my sin? Nothing. But the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and hear me let God be God because when you encounter this kind of love you can't help but change but you cannot find love by changing but when you do find love change and understand it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance